Mr. Snedden, do you have any second thoughts about the conspiracy charge? A lot of people felt it made the trial a little longer, a little more complicated, and was, as I just mentioned to Ron, a reach. Well, we just don't agree with that. And our analysis uh, was that uh, there was substantial evidence to support that charge, and uh, we still believe, believe that. The fact that it extended the trial, um, I mean, that's, that's the way you have trials for. I mean, uh, uh, I, I just I don't agree with that assessment. Um, and uh, we felt that we charged appropriately and still feel we charged appropriately. You were strongly in favor of a gag order in this case, and, and what it seemed to... It mean was that on a daily basis, representatives of the Jackson family who were not under that gag order could go out and speak to the press and rebut what was happening in the courtroom while members of the prosecution team could not. In hindsight, did that strategy backfire? No, I don't think so. I, and uh, I don't believe in, in trying cases in the media. We knew what the, what the downside was uh, to that situation. We knew that they could continue to leak things to the media and to other representatives. But um, I believe that knowing the judge as I do, that there would have been a gag order in place no matter what had happened, uh, whether we had asked for it or not, because he had some real concerns about the pretrial publicity. So, no, I don't believe that, that anything different would have happened whether we didn't ask for it or not. It was, there was going to be a protective order. And Mr. Snedden, you know that people have said that there was some sort of personal vendetta in this. You against Michael Jackson, you have strongly denied that. But once you started to hear the chatter about it, did you give any thought to removing yourself from the prosecution team in this case? No, I didn't. There's no reason to because it isn't true. I'm doing the job and I have the institutional knowledge of the 93-94 investigation, which as you know if you follow the trial became very important since a number of those witnesses were called. I was familiar with them, they had trust in me, and I, I did nothing wrong or inappropriate and I was just doing my job. So no, there was never any thought in my mind uh, uh, to remove myself and, and frankly it wouldn't have done any good because they still would have said I'm behind the scenes orchestrating this whole thing. So that, that's just a, a smoke screen, that's all that is. Not guilty, not guilty, ten times not guilty for Michael Jackson. In California, a dramatic conclusion to one of the most sensational trials in entertainment history. He appeared to dry a tear or two as the court clerk read the verdict that exonerated him on all counts. His legal victory could not have been any more clear or any more convincing. This evening, Michael Jackson is a free man. ABC's Jim Avila covered the entire trial. Charlie, there were tears in the faces of at least two of the jurors, and as you say, Michael Jackson did dab his face with Kleenex. At his defense table, one of his attorneys was sobbing uncontrollably, and his prosecutor nemesis, well, his face was red, as Michael Jackson was totally vindicated. Ten times he heard, not guilty. There's an old saying in the law, uh, where there's smoke, there may be fire, but in this case the jury found that there was no fire, just, just smoke. Now Jackson left court immediately afterwards without any comment. He went home to Neverland where he's not yet been seen. As for the prosecutor, when asked if he was through with his pursuit of Michael Jackson, he would only say no comment. ABC's Cynthia McFadden followed the entire trial, joins us now here in New York to help analyze the verdict. Cynthia. Hindsight 2020, but should these charges have been brought in the first place? I think so, Charlie. I think when a child makes a credible claim against someone who the prosecutor knows has settled multi-million dollar judgments for similar claims in the past, those charges need to be taken seriously. So I think it was fair to file the charges. So then the other question is, why did the prosecution lose this? A complete victory for the defense. You know, I think in this instance some of the reasons and some of the problems that we knew from the outset. The prosecutor doesn't get to pick his victim or his victim's family. There were credibility problems from the very beginning with both the boy and his mother. And I think the jury at the end of the day decided that those credibility problems were just insurmountable. So many times the prosecution brought up a witness that did not do what the prosecution said that witness would do. A sloppy prosecution? And you bring up, I think, the final and most important point. The prosecution didn't have its duct to something in line. There's no question that this prosecution was not as well conducted as perhaps it could have been. And perhaps there could have been a victory if the case had been better and more uh, folk, if presented in a more focused way. All right, Cynthia McFadden, our chief legal correspondent. Thanks.
Michael Jackson, not guilty on all counts. Good morning, Robin. What a difference an hour makes in the life of Michael Jackson. He came to court facing terrible charges, charges that drained him of health and spirit. And then moments later, vindication, finally going home to Neverland to sleep, unburdened by the prospect of prison. A party at Neverland. Jackson family and attorneys celebrating complete victory immediately after the verdict. Lead Jackson attorney Tom Mesereau smiling broadly in full view of 300 fans outside the gates who were thrilled by the win, but disappointed Jackson made no personal appearance. We asked him everybody to leave the area. Mesereau's first public comment after the verdict, a quick declaration. Justice was done. The man's innocent, he always was. Justice. Inside court, there were tears in every corner from two of the jurors, Mother Catherine Jackson. Jackson's attorney Susan Yu was sobbing. And next to her, the defendant dabbing his eyes. ABC's Taina Hernandez was watching not 10 feet away. He started to cry more and more with each not guilty. There were more tears at one point. He even put both hands to his eyes to, to stop the flow. Thank you so much. Now we turn to the Michael Jackson jurors, the people who gave him his freedom. Joining us now, first question, second thoughts, anybody here? No second, no second thoughts. thoughts. Did you ever, any one of you, raise your hand if you did, did any one of you ever think... Guilty? That came up quite a bit. But uh, after weighing the evidence and lack of, uh, we realized that um, there wasn't enough, enough evidence there to prosecute him. I wanted to ask about the mother. She would look at the jury and snap her fingers and say, you know, this is the way it should be. And she was right in our faces. Yeah. Yes. That was very intimidating because I was directly, Mike and I were directly across from the witnesses. And she would turn right to us like she's just... Yeah. But Melissa, what did that say to you? I mean, apart from how it made you feel, what did that say to you about what, who she was and the testimony she gave? Um, her testimony, a, a lot of the parts of her testimony, I wanted to just break out laughing, but I couldn't, you know. She was trying to be pitiful to us, I felt. Did you, do you worry in any way, do you worry that how you felt about her in some way influenced how you felt about his testimony. Did you feel no. he was lying? Did you feel the son was lying? Yeah, there, there, were, there were times you could tell, but I mean, it all had to go back to the evidence. So, I mean, it's like right there, the evidence, you know, it's, you have to go beyond a reasonable doubt. I don't think the mother inflicted good values in her kids, and that made me have a hard time believing anybody in the family. Thomas Snedden came out and said the thing he'd learned about this was celebrity, celebrity influences. Are you sure, are you sure that this gigantically renowned guy walking in a room had no influence at all? We talked about that right. when we first started um, the trial mm -hmm. and when we went into deliberations that came up. We talked about that quite intensively, I think. And uh, we all felt that we have to look at this man just like we would anybody else, you know, just anyone off the street, anyone in particular, you know, just not look at him as a celebrity. In fact, as the trial was going mm -hmm. on, we really didn't uh, pay much attention to him. Once in a while, you would look at him to see his demeanor, to see what he was, yeah. had certain questions or testimony yeah. that was been presented. But At first, it was kind of intimidating, uh, somewhat. I mean, to be honest, it was. But for sitting there for four months and watching him every day, and I came to realize that, you know, he's a person, he's a human. And to me that just the celebrity status just went out, he's, a, he's a, just another person. The other lawyer for Michael Jackson lost it. When she lost it, I lost it. Because she was so, throughout the whole trial, she would look at the witnesses, yes. not move. She would just stare at them the whole time. She never slept. And um, she was always so alert and everything. And then to see, my gosh, her emotions just come pouring out. I, uh, that was just, oh. Any of the rest of you see anything in his face at that moment? What did you see? He looked over at us. In yeah. fact, uh, I made eye contact with him when the last part of the verdict was read. And he kind of just mouthed. He didn't openly say it, but he just kind of like said, you know. To me, too. Mm -hmm. And there were some tears. I yeah, he was yeah. crying. Tell yeah, he was crying. Sobbing a little bit. And everybody always thought, because they were surprised there were no more African Americans. 
on the jurors. Everyone always wondered if it would have been any different. I mean, not everyone wondered, but I guess people who, who assume sort of racial stereotype. Just want to know from you how you felt about this verdict all the way going through so that everybody out there can hear that. Well, when it first started, I felt really bitter because I was the only black African American. I wasn't even a juror. I was an alternate. That's what really made me mad. I, I, I trusted him. I really did trust him. When I left, I, I thought to myself that that um, whatever verdict that they come up with, I'll, I'll stand 100 percent behind. Yeah, but one of the things you've talked about surprised some people is that in your own family, you have someone who is a registered sex offender and you said that this gave you more understand more fairness in the case they that was rather misquoted I have a grandson that was 18 was out with a bunch of boys streaking he was the only one that was 18 and someone dared him to flash instead of streak he flashed he got caught and that's a felony and he was 18 and that's his sex offense Abrams Report. Here is Dan Abrams. Also coming up, we're going to have another exclusive uh, in the case. Um, we're going to talk about a, uh, a boy, a little boy. He was the entertainer's guest and he was a child. There had been a report that Jackson had gotten him drunk. Now he's speaking out exclusively to us. We're going to hear from him. Twelve-year-old boy, back in 1988, spent four days with Michael Jackson. Now Richard Matsura is coming forward to defend Jackson and publicly dispute an article in Vanity Fair which said that Jackson served the boy wine. NBC News' Mike Taibbi interviewed Matsura from Japan and joins us now. Hey, Mike. Hey, Dan. How you doing? Actually, we spoke with him on Thursday night via a two-camera uh, hookup. Uh, Richard Matsura is 18 now, a college student, and he says he contacted NBC News to correct a, an erroneous published report, that report in Vanity Fair, about his experience with Michael Jackson in Tokyo six years ago. I was taken to the hotel where my father and Michael had a meeting, um, and at that time, um, somebody escorted me to Michael's room, and we just um, uh, introduced each other. I said I was uh, Rich Ricky Matsura. He said he was Michael Jackson. Ricky Matsura told us from Tokyo he was the then 12-year-old boy who spent four days in the presence of the pop star in 1998. The boy described in a magazine article as having been supplied by one of Jackson's people with three soda cans filled with wine to the point where he became sick. His father, according to the article, was so furious he immediately ended talks with Jackson about a theme park venture. How much, if any of it, is true? Absolutely zero. Besides the fact of Michael Jackson coming to Japan in 98 and actually uh, giving a press conference about this theme park business, all the other allegations and statements made about his trip to Japan in 98 are completely false. Completely false. Matsura said his four days with Jackson were a memorable whirlwind that gave him a window into the mind of Michael Jackson. He says what he saw as a 12-year-old boy helped him understand what so many adults cannot. When he says sharing a bed, everybody's out to make it like he's, you know, going to sexually molest them. And that's absolutely not true. He never had the chance to, to joke around as a kid, you know, play water gun fights and that kind of thing. It was all strictly business pressure on him as a child. And that's what he seeks in children, is that worryless childhood. Matsura says Jackson never said or did anything inappropriate over the four days he spent in his company. He says he did drink a champagne toast under his father's supervision and that he did later become sick. He's coming forward now on his own because he knows that at least one of the stories about Michael Jackson is untrue. I was there, you know, I know everything that happened. Did anybody from Michael Jackson's camp, I'm talking about lawyers, 
public relations people, spokespeople, offer to pay you anything to come forward, or have they paid you anything to come forward? I, I could open my bank account records for everybody. No, no money. No, not at all. All right, I spoke earlier today with Maureen Orth, who's the, art, uh, the author of that article in Vanity Fair and one of the recognized experts on the Jackson saga. Ms. Orth acknowledges that she was never able to actually speak with Richard Mitsura, but that she stands by her source for the story. And in fact, the magazine this afternoon, Dan, issued a statement saying that since hearing Richard Mitsura's account of what transpired in Japan in 1998, Vanity Fair has contacted its on-the-record source for the story, former Jackson Chief Financial Officer Myung-ho Lee, and Lee says, I've read the Vanity Fair article, and I stand by everything I said in the article. Now, I should tell you, Dan, we also spoke with Ryosuke Matsura, who's Ricky's father, and he stands by his son's version. So, like so many other tales from the Jackson story, this is one where someone is clearly right and someone is clearly wrong. <laughs> All right, Mike Taibbi is our guy out there on the Jackson story. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. All right, Dan. Journalist Maureen Orth is covering the trial for Vanity Fair magazine. First of all, despite or, or perhaps because of the gag order, there's been lots of information and misinformation leaked about the case. Can you give us a summary of the prosecution's actual case against Michael Jackson? Well, the prosecution uh, said that Michael Jackson was somebody who had exploited these children who had given them a lot of liquor uh, that this family this boy was a cancer victim and that this family had come to the ranch thinking that he was their savior when in fact he had uh, made Neverland a place of no restrictions no wants and turned people who were once well-mannered kids into hellions and that they would show in vivid particular with witnesses how much he had plied them with liquor from a secret wine cellar and that they had been held against their will. Meanwhile, Maureen, anything unexpected from the prosecution? Well, I think really the amount of pornography that they said that they found littered all over the private area of Michael Jackson's bathroom and his bed chambers, the fact that the brother of the accuser had seen him molest his brother who was probably passed out from the liquor he had been given. Um, it's really an accumulation of detail about how much the uh, family was was subjected to, which of course is completely contradicted by uh, the defense. One of the major points that Tom Mesero, the defense lawyer, was making yesterday was that this mother was somebody who had gone many times before to use her children as tools. He's trying to show the difference between this family that was grifters, uh, a scheming stage mother perhaps who is out for money, and to bring the, the power of celebrity names. I think the idea that he was suggesting that Michael Jackson was a great friend of Princess Diana's and they had both been victimized, uh, mm -hmm. things like that. In order to think this verdict is good news, you've got to believe that this boy, the alleged victim, and his brother are both lying. No, I think in order to think this, good, this, this verdict is good news, and I do, is that this jury, despite the uh, media's attempt to demonize Michael Jackson, I think rose to the level of saying that if they were not convinced beyond a reasonable doubt, they were not going to convict him based on whatever biases they had, and they said in the press conference some of them came in with biases, or whatever they considered different or strange, but based on criminal behavior. And I think that is what the criminal justice system is supposed to do. At one point, he compared himself to Nelson Mandela, 
Do you think that's a fair comparison? But the, but the fact of the matter is they compared him to a criminal, and the jury said no. That's what I'm saying. Right? Well, he was that, accused of child molestation. I mean, that is a And the jury a said offense. no. I mean, you, like even tonight in this situation, pun intended, we're still talking about juice, Jesus juice. Well, we don't even know if that's a fact. The jury acquitted Michael. We're still talking about all of the allegations as if they, in fact, were proven to be well, true. Okay. I know a lot of people in the entertainment industry. I don't consider any of them to not engage in bizarre activity. It does not make them a criminal. I also think that a lot of the things that Michael has been sensitive and supportive of uh, has been overlooked. I think it is true that Michael was in many ways a uh, jackal until he stood up and started talking about things in the music industry. All of a sudden he became wacko. Well, Michael didn't change that wait, much. Wait I second. think Michael wait, decided wait, 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 Reverend Sharpton, with all due respect, I just went to so you're talking about when you marched up to Sony Music headquarters with Michael Jackson uh, and he referred to Tommy Mottola, the chairman at that point of Sony Music, as a, quote, a racist and very, very, very devilish. And the next day you give an interview to the New York Post in which you said, I have no idea what he's talking about. Tommy Mottola is not devilish and he's not a racist. No, what I said was that I had no personal experience of that and that Michael came to a forum at National Action Network and expressed himself. He dealt with the president of the company. I didn't, just like you tonight are making allegations about Michael that I have no experience with. But I clearly agree with Michael that there was a lot of problems with particularly black artists in the industry, still is, and a lot of people have been undermined. And I think sure. that began a lot of Michael's problems in the music industry. Well, you, uh, it's, uh... Are we blind to the fact that our children are raging against the indifference, crying out against the abandonment, of thundering against the neglect. Heal the Kids is about doing something about making a difference in trying to help adults and parents realize that it is our power to change the world that our children live in. Who among us would have believed that the sound of children at their playgrounds would be replaced by the sound of automatic machine gun fire at our schools? that the sound of little girls skipping rope would be overshadowed by the frantic shrills of children dodging bullets. Yet, instead of loving our children more, we installed metal detectors in our schools. 